Hello everybody, welcome to the workshop. Let me begin by asking you if you know the answer to this million dollar question on the screen. You may please key in your answers in the chat box. What do you think the client wants? Reading the client's mind requires reading and rereading the brief. What role does the brief play? It provides guidance. It sets the tone, it defines the limits, it keeps you on track, and it tells you what not to do. It basically has your back at all times. Yet, we seldom give it the importance it deserves. Now, this workshop will equip you with the skills to analyze the brief and create content that lives up to the client's expectations. All right, so how can you really read what's on the client's mind? Now, these are the typical elements of a brief that you will see. There will be information about the client, the target group, the tone and the point of view, the, the goal or intended purpose of the article will be clearly stated. The, there will be information on whether brand integration is required, what's the kind of call to action one needs to include, what will be the word count, what kind of English to use, and most importantly, it will tell you to avoid plagiarism. Now, in the next hour or so, we will see how to decode the brief and hunt for information so that you can deliver a top-notch article. Ready? Let's go. Now, start by getting familiar with the brand that you're writing for. Get the full lowdown on the client. Now, it is unlikely that you will always know who the client is, but you can figure it out one way or another. Most brands, have a distinct personality. Now through their products, their advertisements, packaging, choice of brand ambassadors, brands reflect a certain character. Let's see a few examples. This logo instantly rings a bell, right? Can you guess the brand? Guys, type in the chat box if you can. Absolutely correct. Wherever we fastest fingers first, uh, what goes to wherever we for guessing Apple. Now, what does brand Apple stand for according to you? You can write your answers again in the chat box. What does brand Apple, what is the thought that comes to your mind when you see this logo or when someone mentions the brand Apple to you? Waiting for your answers in the chat box, guys. What values or attributes does brand Apple? Exclusivity, advanced tech, luxury, pride, luxury, premium products, absolutely. High security, correct. Class, pride, aesthetic. Wonderful. What about this one? The brand, as you may have guessed, is Dove. What attribute does Dove stand for according to you? Purity, skin friendly products, correct. Gentle on skin, soft and smooth. Peace, okay, softness, good skin care. Okay, anyone else? Premium skincare product, all right. Next, I want to show you this brand, Mountain Dew. What is the thought that comes to your mind when you see Mountain Dew or a bottle of Mountain Dew? Anybody? Youth, dark age youth, of course. It's a refreshing drink. Somebody said accelerate. Wow, okay. Fun and pushing limits. It's a refreshing energy drink. Okay, cheeta bhi pita hai. Okay. Yeah, it represents thrill, yes, dare and refresh. What else? Challenging oneself, absolutely correct, bang on. And I'll have one more brand here for you to guess, which is this one. What does this swoosh represent to you? This is obviously brand Nike. What does brand Nike stand for in your mind? Comfort, premium footwear, okay? Achievement, yes. 
so bito says durable sorry faster higher stronger durability yes comfort and durability athletics absolutely sports high quality athleisure sports footwear pushing yourself okay great so clearly we know that each of these brands stands for something apple stands for innovation it stands for aspiration dove stands for self love beauty that is skin deep and not superficial brand nike stands for inspiration while you can say mountain dew is all about facing your fears now each of these brands has a distinct voice and finding this voice is important so get to know the client who are they what do they do who do they serve what is the brand voice what is whether it's humorous inspiring or serious who are their competitors where are they from and what is their usp sometimes the brief may not have all the information that you're looking for what do you do then you become sherlock you go through the website to understand what type of services or products the brand offers whether they operate in the b2b space or the b2c space you find out the brand voice whether it's friendly neutral serious find out where they are based in india or elsewhere find out who they are talking to now let's put it to the test let's explore the website of the whole truth foods and find answers to some of the questions that we saw earlier now raise your hands if you've heard of this brand the whole truth foods have you heard of this brand okay cool some of you have heard of this brand okay so this is a packaged food brand uh, that prides itself on using clean ingredients okay let's explore now it has products like uh, protein bars and chocolates and nut butters so its competitors could be brands like pintola or nestle or happy jars or bagaries yeah and it is very very low vocal and upfront about its promise of using clean ingredients now look at what the site what its website says never have i ever added any of these sugar uh, flavor preservatives uh, sugar alcohol soy or gluten or artificial sweeteners or any sort of color okay no half truths no false claims and definitely no asterisk marks so as you can see okay never have i ever is a popular drinking game some of you may know that and using that the brand conveys the usp of clean ingredients in a bold quirky contemporary way now the whole truth foods also comes clean about how their products are made so if you go on their website you will see something like this there is a uh, it gives you a peek into the manufacturing facility of the company so there is a, a the video called bar parivar where they actually show you who makes the protein bars that they have okay hum bar nahi pyar banate hain that's what it says there is another video that shows you the bar khana in 3d where you can actually see how these protein bars are made so the brand uses english and colloquial terms to make its point rather well and interestingly see how the website describes uh, one of its products the hazelnut spread for instance made with real hazelnuts no essence hazelnut cocoa in a jar things went a little too far sparks flew birds sang and this yummy spread came with a bang so instead of plain boring descriptions of uh, ingredients and products their descriptions are actually playful and funny okay so tell me uh, what do you think or rather who do you think their target consumer is i want you to type this in the chat box who do you think their products are meant for or who do you think they are talking to muskan says youth and kids okay anybody else millennials okay youngsters fitness freaks absolutely upper middle class people probably youth and children people who pay attention to fitness yes to the details absolutely bam na very good point people who pay attention to the details people who are into health and fitness yes millennials yes anybody else health freaks correct people who are health conscious okay so 
they are talking to obviously health conscious folks people who are fit or are on their journey towards fitness and are cautious about what they eat so most of you guessed it correctly next i want you to tell me what type of blogs or content do you think they would post the i mean to say by they i mean the whole truth foods what kind of blogs or content would they like to write or post on their site again kids uh, uses the chat box health related fitness food and stuff correct anybody else health and fitness related yes about the benefits of ingredients yes fitness promotions fitness digestive system harms of preservatives absolutely harms of preservatives benefits of whole foods health and food health related along with branding their product healthy lifestyle yes so what okay thank you for uh, all your answers guys i'll be moving on let's just see what their blog section looks like so here it is these are the topics here is how i got my cholesterol levels down why you can't eat just one chip the definitive guide to smart food shopping solving the mystery of afternoon slump okay eight swaps to eat better healthy every day and things like diwali indulgence won't make you fat so these topics uh, these are topics that an evolved fitness conscious person would find instantly interesting the content uh, appears informative but it's it's packaged in a humorous way for example if you see the illustration of why you can't eat just one chip you can see the guy is actually snorting chips okay now it's funny yet it's extremely relatable so now there are videos on the site as well uh, one of them is about which bread is healthier the articles and videos mostly are busting some kind of myth shattering misconceptions or are aimed at empowering consumers to make smarter food choices now look at this look at the video topics uh, on the screen is honey better than brown sugar or is jaggery better than honey look at the language used in the article uh, next to the video screen which is uh, under definitive guide of to smart food shopping ignore photos decode claims read ingredients call bullshit so there is a pattern followed across the sections of the brand's website in a nutshell here's what stands out about the whole food foods website the brand is bold and outspoken the brand voice is fun it's contemporary it's witty the brand is talking to health and fitness conscious consumers who want to make the right food choices and the blogs are eye opening and myth busting most importantly the brand voice is strikingly consistent throughout the website whether it's the home page or the products page or the blog or the about us section not a single word seems out of place the content is refreshing and accurate and connects with the consumer i uh, do you all agree raise your hands if you do just want to ensure you're not falling asleep okay doc okay so let's move on to knowing and understanding the target group or as we say tg before that let's see why people go on the internet so this is something that you probably already know people go on the internet for answers to questions or they're looking for solutions to a problem or they're looking for some kind of advice or second opinion or they want to clear some sort of confusion or dilemma that they're facing and what about brands brands want to come into the picture by offering a these in the form of branded content so your content should be able to address one of these expectations but how you craft the content will depend on who you are talking to visualize the target group now is the brand talking to gen z consumers now some of you mentioned that uh, you thought uh, the whole truth foods was talking to millennials which is quite possible millennials do is an important target group for them uh, is the brand is any brand talking to professionals in the 35 to 45 age group are they talking to retired people are they talking to consumers in the metros or the small towns is there any specific gender they are talking to 
So your language and writing style when you're writing branded content should vary depending on the target group. Fun fact, did you know that Gen Z professionals, now when I say Gen Z, uh, I mean people born in the late 90s, early 2000s, they are signing off emails like this. I mean, how many Gen Z people are here today in this workshop? Raise your hands. Gen Z guys. Okay. Just one. Okay. 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 All right. So Gen Z people are saying, ending their emails with lukewarm regards and not warm regards. They write another day, another slay and not have a nice day like some of us. So with every new generation, there is a new vocabulary, a new talking style. Even authors, okay, authors have distinct writing styles. Now, the writing style of a Chetan Bhagat may not entirely be, writing style of a Chetan Bhagat may not entirely appeal to somebody who reads an Arundhati Roy, right? For instance, readers of a half-girlfriend may not really enjoy reading the God of Small Things. And vice versa. Even filmmakers have a distinct style. Now, can you imagine a gory murder scene in a Suraj Barjatiya movie? No, right? So let's look at a scenario. A real life scenario. Uh, something that you guys probably write about a lot. Uh, how do you write an article on, say, recurring deposits for two different TG? One is young professionals in their 20s and the other 35 plus adults. So, here it is. And people who are at the start of their careers, people, I'm talking about the TG number one, which is professionals in their 20s. They are at the start of their careers. They are used to spending more than saving. And they are unaware of most investment instruments. So how do you, how do you write for them? So you should ensure that the content that you're writing is able to inculcate the habit of saving you can cite examples and advice from self-made billionaires like Warren Buffett. You must present a recurring deposit as a simple saving option, something that appeals to them. And the article should basically inform, inspire, and encourage. Now, when you're writing for professionals who are slightly older, in their 30s, who want to save and are looking for options, Try and avoid preaching the importance of saving because these people already know that they need to save and they're probably already on their way to, uh, towards building a corpus. Instead, focus on RD as a beneficial addition to their investment token. Treat the reader as someone who is informed and is looking for a reliable advice or some convincing. So your article, you must, through your article, sound confident and authentic. Now, here are two examples of uh, how to write a personal finance article. This appeared in CNBC. Now, both are on the same topic uh, called saving tips. For the younger TG, this is how the article reads. This is just a part of the article that appeared. Making smart financial choices in your 20s can help set you up for the law for long term success. That includes creating a plan to pay off student loans, avoiding credit card debt, building an emergency fund and working towards hitting bigger goals like having enough money for a down payment on a house. Taking control of your finances at a young age, even if you feel cash trapped at, in an entry level job, will make it easier for you to achieve your goals in your 30s and beyond. For the older target group, the article reads this, this way. By your 40th birthday, you are likely more financially stable than you were in your younger years. And hopefully that gives you the opportunity to achieve big goals like buying a home and growing your family. But it's important not to lose sight of future goals, including saving for retirement. Now, I want you guys to point out the difference that you see in these two articles. How do you think these two articles are different? You can type in your answers in the chat box or if you want, you could unmute your mic and speak. How are the two articles different according to you? Waiting for your answers in the chat box. Yes, future goals are different for different age groups, correct? Their goals are different and so are their thoughts, correct? 
Anyone else? What are the one or two things that the article does differently? Articles are different because of the emphasis, style of writing, focus point, the language differs, correct? Younger TGs being encouraged to obtain things, older TGs being told how they can live comfortably, correct? First one is emphasizing how much saving is important. The second one is about how to keep with good quality. Absolutely, very good point. The TG can relate easily, yes. The use of language or the tone, yes, the tone. Older people have less time to achieve their goals, yes, focus, targeting, yes. So you get the gist, right? You can actually write differently for different TG just based on what kind of language you use, what kind of examples you use, what kind of goals you're mentioning in the article. Similarly, here's an example of a branded content article on saving, uh, titled Ways to Save Money in Your Daily Life. Now, this is written for a younger, younger target group. So, uh, part of the article reads, it might seem like a good idea now to put off saving until a few years later, but the few years later will come up much faster than you would expect. There is no better time than right now to begin putting aside a little money for your future. And all you need to do is make some small changes in your approach towards life and expenses. Before you know it, it'll, before you know it, you will start to see the savings add up. Now it is clearly aimed at encouraging the TG to start saving. Here's another article. Uh, this one talks about uh, retirement plans to people in their 40s. The, uh, a part of the article says hitting 40 means reaching your peak productive years. And you should be on your way to achieving a decent corpus as part of your retirement planning. Individuals in their 40s have multiple financial goals. They need to save for the university fees of their children, for the annual family holiday, and even for building a house. So this article clearly acknowledges that the reader is aware of financial planning and investments, just like what we discussed a couple of slides earlier. Time for a quick exercise. Uh, I want you to identify the target group of the articles that will follow in the next slide. Any guesses of what place this is that you see in the slide here? Any guesses of what destination it could be? Wow, bang on. Shobitro says Thailand, absolutely. Okay. Moving on, guys, to the next slide. Here it is. These are the two articles, okay, about the same destination, which is Phuket in Thailand. This was pub these two articles were published on two different sites. So I'm going to read it out to you, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Article one. The headline says: Rich history, serene beaches, and marvelous food. Phuket is more than just a honeymoon destination. For a long time, Thailand has been associated with honeymoons, especially for Indians. It makes sense too. The country has a variety of things to offer, from nightlife to markets to beaches. And while Bangkok and Pattaya remain the first two choices, Phuket also isn't far behind in terms of popularity among couples. On my recent trip to Phuket though, I figured there is more to the island and to reduce it to a romantic destination is doing it a disservice. Article number two, uh, this is how the headline reads, how Phuket is getting its groove back. Never doubt the bankability of Leonardo DiCaprio. When the film The Beach, starring a young Leo as an American backpacker looking for paradise lost hit theaters, it might as well have been a promo video for Thai tourism. The promise of untouched beaches prompted hordes to descend on Koh Phi Phi, where the movie was filmed, and anything in its vicinity, particularly nearby Phuket. The year the movie came out, the total number of visitors to Phuket leapt by more than a quarter of a million visitors, mostly foreign. Everyone wanted a sliver of that pearly sand and emerald ocean until there was hardly any pearly sand left to roll out your beach tower. Now, I want you to, by yourselves, go through this, uh, these two different articles and tell me what are the two different types of readers the article, articles are talking to. Again, I request you to put in your uh, answers in the chat box. Okay, Muskan is really fast. She says, first one is for solo travelers or friends, second, tourism and researchers. Interesting. Anybody else? 
can point out the difference in who these two articles are talking to. First is more like a personal experience. Second is more of a description with references. Okay. First article is targeting single people. Bang on. Very good. Nora's good observation. Anybody else? Couples in the first. Okay. Anyone can point out more differences? Okay, newlyweds and singles uh, for the first one, travel enthusiasts. Second, very good, Ankit. Uh, elderly moneyed guys in the second. Okay. All right, nice. So I like how you guys are thinking. So here's the reveal. The first article appeared on Swoop Whoop, while the second article appeared in Conte Nast Traveler. So as you guys, some of you rightly guessed, the first article is more generic and it speaks to a younger demographic, while the Second article, which appeared in Condé Nast, speaks to a slightly more evolved, well-traveled audience. Okay. What is POV and why it matters? POV is point of view, which is the writer's position or perspective in with which you write the article. Now, there is first person POV, the second person POV, and third person POV. First person POV is when you write with I, my, we, our. Second person is when you use you, your. Third person is when you use pronouns like he, his, they, her, him, she, their. Now, usually the client will clearly state the POV that they want the article to be written in. First person POV would make sense for a personal blog or an opinion piece or an expert take. Second person POV is most common in uh, SEO articles, while third person POV would make sense for news articles or reports about certain events that happen. Quick question. Can you tell me what the POV used in novels is? Use the chat box, please, and tell me what do you think is the POV used in fiction books? Yes, correct. Third person. Okay. Yes, cool. So, um, Somita, Sobitro, Adriana, Tanu, Aisha, all of you are right. It is third person. Moving on to this most uh, a topic of uh, grave, a topic that deserves a lot of attention. Most of us have knowingly or unknowingly fallen into this trap, the plagiarism trap. Now, plagiarism, it can be direct, it can be self-plagiarism, it can be accidental plagiarism. How can we prevent this from happening? Now, first, let's go into some details about what each of these mean. Now, direct plagiarism is when you copy word for word, directly lifting sentences from another site or platform or without permission or attribution. Doing this even partially is unethical. Self-plagiarism is using parts of one's own writing, using content from your previously published work. An accidental plagiarism is when you paraphrase or quote without citing source. Now, this could be study findings or research data or statistics. Right? None of this is cool. Even a hint of plagiarism can ruin all the effort that we put in writing an article. Now, let's see an example of plagiarism. How many of you watched uh, Pathan? You can raise your hand if you did. Okay. That's it. Okay, that's it. quite a few number. I urge you to uh, you guys to watch it. It's a good movie. I'm digressing. Let's get back to the topic. So here's a review of uh, Pathan that appeared in the Times of India. Uh, it says, I'm just reading a part of it. It says, Pathan is an ambitious action thriller that plays to the gallery and lives up to the hype. Far-fetched in writing, but high on star power and style. Pathan initially seems like a filmy Mountain Dew commercial, which slowly but steadily finds its footing. Now, if you or I were to write a review, what would constitute plagiarism and what and what wouldn't? Let's take a look. The first one, how not to write. 
Now, this would totally be plagiarism because this is one of this is paraphrased. Pathan is a wonderful thriller action film that lives up to the excitement. Although the writing may not be up there, the star cast and style quotient are top notch. Initially, the movie looks like a Mountain Dew commercial, but that changes gradually. So it's a clear case of just you know changing a few things here and there, and pretty much lifting the review from the Times of India. This is absolutely not the way to do it. Now, how do you do it? Pathan has been getting some rave reviews from critics across the country, and rightly so. Shah Rukh Khan could not have made a more stylish comeback. The movie has several over-the-top moments. The movie has several over-the-top moments, though. A review in the Times of India aptly describes the first half of the film as a filmy Mountain Dew commercial. Now, as you see, uh, you are attributing the, the to the original source, which is the right way to do it. So you may not, you may have taken some bits from there, but you are actually attributing it to the source. I request uh, you to unmute your mics. Somebody's mic is on. Okay. Now, how do you keep plagiarism at bay? Now that you've seen an example, uh, let's see how you can avoid getting in, falling into the trap of plagiarism. First is a no-brainer, you got to be original. Understand the topic and idea and write it in your own words wherever possible. But remember that while you're doing that, you must maintain absolute factual accuracy. But refer to multiple sources before starting to write and avoid taking chunks of information from one place. What we generally tend to do because we are hard pressed for time possibly is you see the topic and you Google the topic and you just rely on the first couple of results that you see and then you try and use that to make the article, which is not exactly the best way to do it. Refer to multiple sources. What it will do is also educate you on the topic and it will also tell you where to, uh, how to start writing and including all the information that you found maybe on five, five different sites instead of as against one or two. Provide sources hyperlinks and attributions wherever possible. Now, these could be announcements or these could be survey findings or some kind of statistics. It only makes your article look better. It adds heft to your article. It adds credibility to your article. It shows you that, it shows the reader that the writer has actually taken the pain and effort to, to write a well-balanced piece. Use the plagiarism checker tools uh, that we have. You can use Grammarly, CopyScape, or whatever tool that you use. It's a good indicator of whether or not your article is plagiarized. Remember that uh, names of places and certain technical terms and uh, words can be overlooked because you can't change certain things. Like if you can't change fixed deposits, that word will remain as is. You cannot have a replacement for that. But everything else needs to be as close to original as possible. Absolutely do not use paraphrasing tools or bots to evade plagiarism or you will end up with poorly worded text like this. Now this one rectangle that you see on top is the original text that appears in on the UNESCO site. An immense mausoleum of white marble built in Agra between 1631 and 1648 by order of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his favorite wife. The Taj Mahal is the jewel of Muslim art in India and one of the universally admired masterpieces of the world's heritage. Put, it, put this into a spin board and you end up with this uh, joke of a paragraph. A huge catacomb of white marble worked in Agra somewhere in the range of 1631 and 1648 by request of the Mughal ruler Shah Jahan in memory of his number one spouse. The Taj Mahal is a gem of Muslim craftsmanship in India and one of the generally appreciated showstoppers of the world's legacy. It's laughable the way it has turned out, right? So do not use spin bots or paraphrasing tools. You're not doing yourself a favor and definitely not doing a favor to the editor. Okay, moving on to the next topic, which is the goal or purpose of the article. Now, what sort of impact or effect is the article supposed to have on the reader? I think uh, it would be fair to say that the purpose of the article could be one of these two, which is provide information or impart knowledge or persuade the reader to buy or act. Now, if the intent is to provide information, 
then we ought to be straight. We ought to be to the point, accurate, and leave the reader well informed. In this case, you must use statistics and research to paint an accurate picture. When you're persuading the reader to buy or act, be descriptive, excite and evoke interest in the reader, involve the reader and nudge them to take action or at least consider taking action. Now here, it would be imperative to have a call to action or as we say, CTA. Now, can you guys tell me what a CTA is? Or can you give me some examples of CTA that you've used or seen or read? You can type it uh, in the chat box. Give me an example of a CTA, a call to action. What I mean is, okay, correct. Download now, yes. Buy now is click for more details, asking the reader to take an action like buy now, absolutely. So you guys are familiar with terms, visit the website to know more, click here, correct. So a CTA could be of many types. Okay, it could be to call, buy, or click. For a bank, it could be getting the reader to open a savings account or apply for a loan. Now for a fashion brand, it could be getting the consumer to buy using a coupon code. Or for a hotel, it could be uh, they, the hotel would want the reader to check their website for holiday packages, right? Yes, I can see that some of you responded for the make the client click on the buttons like buying or saving to cards, signing up for a newsletter. Correct. Absolutely. So you guys I can see are familiar with the term, which is great. Now let's look at some examples of CTA. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the term vegan. Right, raise your hands if you all know what vegan and veganism is. Okay, awesome. So it's basically uh, eating only plant-based foods. Now here is an article on uh, veganism that uh, appeared on the World Economic Forum website. There was a time, uh, not I'm reading the article now, there was a time not so long ago when the choice of what to have with your burger was simple. Now the choice is increasingly about the burger itself. Are you sticking with meat or would you rather have a plant-based alternative? There's a lot of research showing that most of us are willing to skip the beef and other animal products in favor of vegan or vegetarian options. So on the occasion of World Vegan Day, we are taking a look at the trends in plant-based diets and the impact those trends might have on efforts to create a more sustainable food economy. Further, the article quotes a Statista Global Consumer Survey. It also mentions the American Heart Association and says that cutting out meat or eating less of it reduces the risk of heart disease stroke, diabetes, high blood pressure, and many forms of cancer. So the article, as you can see, presents facts. It has figures, it has data, and it lets you do the thinking. It also has links to other articles in case the reader wants to explore the topic further. Now, I would say that this is a good example of an informative article. Then there is this article on veganism from the PETA's website. I'll just read it. What happens if you don't go vegan? People always tell you what happens if you go vegan, but have you ever thought about what might, what might happen if you don't? Please, uh, okay, please mute your mics, guys. Yeah. If you don't, okay, if you think choosing not to be vegan affects only you, think again. PETA did some research and here's what we found. Now look at this subhead. You will be responsible for the deaths of many animals. Okay, it's a jarring subhead. It, it makes you squint and want to say what? How can you say that? Now by choosing not to go vegan, you will be responsible for the deaths of at least 14,000 animals in your lifetime. The industries that raises uh, that raise cows, pigs and chickens for their flesh aren't the only ones that kill animals. The US egg industry exploits and kills more than 305 million sensitive hens every year. And that doesn't even include the hundreds of, hundreds of millions of male chicks workers killed at hatcheries. The dairy industry is responsible for the deaths of thousands of cows each year. It separates loving mothers from their babies shortly after birth. 
our fellow animals and individuals who deserve happy and healthy lives. Now, the article is strongly worded, it is provocative, and some of the words used may elicit a very strong reaction from the reader. Here's what the conclusion says. If you don't go vegan, you will be causing harm not only to animals, but also to yourself and the planet. Isn't it time you started saving lives while taking care of yourself and the world you live in? How does this line make you feel? I want you to send in your responses to chat. How does this line make you feel in one word? Anybody? What's the first reaction? Guilty, yes. Anybody else? Okay, all of you. Muskan, Bhavna, Shobitro, everybody's really been offended. Okay, yeah. Thought provoking, yes. Compassion, nice. I think uh, Sakina is going to turn vegan from today. Perplexed, caring. Okay, all right. So clearly, This could make you feel provoked. It could make you feel cornered as some, of, as some of you said it could offend you. Now this article almost forces you to act with its strong language, right? And a very strong CTA. Now, I'd like to add a very big caution note here that this is just an example of uh, a strong CTA and it is not recommended for uh, framing CTAs for branded content articles. I hope uh, you got a sense of what how CTS can be different purely based on what kind of words you use and what kind of conclusion you have. Now let's make a quick stop at the Whole Truth Food website. Uh, here, this is one of their uh, blog posts, and uh, <clears throat> it's an example of uh, a good informative article combined with a call to action. It says, ignore the photos, they are not real, decode the claims, they hide more than they reveal, right? So it's it's telling you what to do. And the goal or purpose of this blog post is to make the reader think and act and also sign up for this newsletter. So the next time, the article hopes that the next time you're shopping for snacks, you will remember to turn the pack and examine the ingredients. So this is a good example of an informative article combined with a call to action that nudges the reader to act. Let's move on. What are these other aspects of a brief? The ignored aspects, if I may say so. It's the word count and the type of English that you use. Now, uh, when I say the type of English, I mean whether to use UK spellings or US spellings. Word count is generally you will see that the client mentions the kind of word count they want. It could be say less than 500 or up till 800. Try meeting the minimum word limit stated. Now word count will obviously differ uh, depending on what the content is, whether it's a blog post or whether it's a social media post or whether it's a thought leadership article, a white paper or any other. The writing a little extra uh, will give the editor some room uh, to edit. So try and write, meet the minimum word count and try, try writing a little excess if possible. It is advisable and it, it, only, it will only make your article read better. And be mindful of where the S should ex, uh, replace Z in the spellings, like when to write skeptical with a C and skeptical with a K. Now it may seem like a very uh, uh, insignificant uh, a detail and it may seem like something you don't really have to pay much attention to, but it is quite critical. Now, if the brand that you're writing for does not speak the language of the people that the article is uh, in, intended to, there is no reason for them to trust either the article or the brand. So spellings matter. The easiest way to be careful about your spellings and whether you're writing using UK or US English is to simply uh, switch to UK, US English in your Word document or on Grammarly. Yeah, so do not ignore uh, either the word count or the spellings or keep it for, you know, like if you have the time, you will go through the document and see whether any changes are to be made, but make it a priority. Now, 
in the next workshop, we're going to tackle everything to do with the writing process. We'll see how you can produce a clean, well-written copy by tapping the right sources, by using statistics and research data, by using examples of uh, people or real events, by using keywords seamlessly, and by getting the flow right. And that brings us to the end of this workshop. I sincerely hope that the past few minutes have been of value to you and it will help you get better at understanding the client expectations and the brief. Now, it is worth noting here that uh, spending adequate time understanding the brief uh, will mean fewer redos and revisions and fewer occasions of you tearing your hair apart trying to read the client's feedback. Okay, if you have questions about what we discussed, I'm happy to take them. This is the end. Amveen, over to you. So if anyone has any queries or any questions that you would like to ask regarding this workshop and the things that we discussed in this workshop, please drop them in. Uh, you can raise your hands if you want to unmute and ask your questions as well. I am reading. Okay, Adriana uh, has a question here in the chat. Yeah, yeah. A little extra would mean 10% over the allocated word count. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, the kind of uh, brief that you guys get, you get a lower limit and an upper limit. So if I'm not wrong, it, uh, a brief would indicate that you need to write between, say, five to 700 words. So when it says five to 700 words, it's good to write, say, 600 words. So a 50 to 100 words extra or 150 words extra would be a good place to start. So that when the editor sits down to edit, I can tell you from experience of editing that uh, what, what you as a writer may write and think that, yes, this is absolutely useful information. Uh, I may think as an editor that this can go or, you know, this is repetitive or this is information that's not relevant and hence I may want to cut it up. But when I do that, I end up with a shorter article. So that's why I say that Writing a little extra would give the editor the room to edit and make the article compact and cogent. Adriana, I hope that answers your question. Are there any other? Okay, uh, there are some questions coming in the chat. Muskan says, if you're confused between UK and US English, any tool which you can use? The best tool to use is uh, the Word document itself, Microsoft Word. You could also uh, get your text through Grammarly, or you can simply, if you're confused about a certain spelling, just type on Google, uh, suppose it's skeptical. You type skeptical and just say UK spelling, and it'll show you the difference between the UK spelling of skeptical and the US spelling. Similarly, if you're uh, confused between install, the spelling of installing, you can just type the spelling and UK, uh, you suppose it's install, go to Google search, type install, say UK spelling and you will get the right spelling. Or you can simply change the region to uh, in the word doc that you're writing the article in or use Grammarly. If the brief, Bhavna has a question which says, if the brief is inadequate, is it very bad to ask enough questions to get a better brief? Absolutely not. You must ask questions because as a content creator, you have to take ownership of what you are producing, right? You are responsible for what you write. And hence, you have you have the right to go on and ask whatever questions that you may need to ask, whether it's about uh, what kind of products does the company have or, uh, you know, what is the kind of tone that the company wants the article to be written in? Whatever question you have, put them across and I'm sure uh, you will have the resources or your agency will have the resources to get those questions answered. So do not be afraid to ask questions. It, of course, it will. Uh, what will happen is it will only try, you know, translate to you writing better content. So ask questions if the brief is inadequate. Ask for more information. What to do when no POV guideline is given? Uh, it's best to ask. 
or if you are writing for a client that already has a blog section on their site, it's good to just take a look at one of those blog posts and you'll realize whether they're writing in first person, writing in second person or third person. So go to whatever is already published to get a sense of what kind of POV you can use. How to handle a rehash articles and avoid plagiarism there? Uh, okay. I'm not sure what this means. Can uh, one of you, Amrini or Anali, tell me what? Uh, Webovi's question on how to handle rehash articles. Webovi, do you want to elaborate on the question yourself? You can go on a new time. Webavi, are you there? So the question as in, uh, for example, there is a project ongoing uh, as in there are ETR and we have to rehash for a website for us to give a summary. So, so how do we tackle that situation and uh, avoid any kind of copy to copy word? Or we have to just uh, rephrase it and uh, give it. So that's the question. Okay, uh, I will try to answer your question to the best that I can uh, because I don't know the exact details of your, uh, of you know, the project and stuff. But uh, usually, if it's purely rehash, uh, which means you only have a one source and you're supposed to take that and turn it around and, you know, bring out an absolutely new article, it's difficult. I mean, hats off to you for being able to do it. But uh, a good place to look for information is now, suppose. Uh, it's a personal finance related article. So there will always be an official press release or an official site where you can get that information from. Okay, if this suppose just an example of, uh, you know, change in tax structure or whatever, try and find the official source of it. Now, when I say official source, I would mean, you know, sites like the RBI or the NPS website or, you know, such where you can get this basic information from. And this basic information will not change no matter what a publication you're writing for. Okay, the wordings and how you present will obviously change based on uh, which publication it is and who the writer is. And you should also try and check if uh, there is another source or a couple of other sources that you can refer to when you are rehashing this so that you are you're, uh, you're not limited by only one article. Does that answer your question, Mervi? So suppose it's one article that appears say on economic times, you sh you may ask if there are other similar articles that you can refer to in order to write it in your own words. Because that at least will not limit you. Um, so to summarize it, to summarize the uh, answer, probably have answered my question. Use multiple source mm -hmm. so as to get and pay attention to details and so that we can give a better delivery. Of yeah, the try and look for the official source of the information because everybody gets it from there, right? So there will always be a press release or a or a, an announcement that somebody, uh, the actual body or the, uh, say if it's the RBI or SEBI or whoever will make. Try and look for that because that is the best source to get information from better than any publication, because even the publication is getting it from there. OK, got it. Um, Thank for you. For official so source, what I'm saying. No problem. Thanks, Sapna. All right. Um, OK, uh, trying to see. If I missed any question, please do remind me. I'm going through the chats. Uh, what to do when did I tackle this? I'm not sure. What to do when no POV guideline is given? I think I did. Uh, OK. Um, Recording of the session, you will have to ask uh, Manali. Okay, sometimes accidental plagiarism comes up in common words. While trying to get rid of them, it compromises on the sentence quality or personal satisfaction with the work. What are the ways to prevent accidental plagiarism? Um, when you say common words, what do you mean, uh, Dipshika? If you don't mind uh, unmuting and talking to me. Uh, Deepshika, are you there? Yes, ma'am. So, for yes, common yeah. words, I mean like the proper nouns, names of uh, some 
celebrities okay so or yeah these places sometimes they come under plagiarism like uh, it has been used in a different article not in the same sense but in a different sense but they come up in the plagiarism issue and uh, then we have to either remove the entire uh, word like if it's a taj mahal if i am talking about taj mahal so it might be used in a unesco site or some other site but i am talking about something other than that so okay. in that I case i have to completely change it yeah no i think uh, dipshika proper nouns are exempt from uh, plagiarism uh, manali uh, correct me if i'm wrong the proper nouns are something that you cannot change i mean even uh, as a uh, i mean when you're writing it you can't change taj mahal to uh, number one mall monument or something like that so proper nouns are absolutely okay for you to uh, use in fact that is something you must be absolutely careful that you are not changing anything about because proper nouns have certain set spellings and all so names of places names of people and certain technical terms that i mentioned before like tax filing or uh, income tax act now these are things that you don't have to worry about because this will appear the way it is you and i don't have to change anything but if it's actual text like two three lines that are you know overlapping with uh, another uh, article then that's something you need to worry about and change that rephrase that and if you think that your article has many instances of uh, such common proper nouns appearing you may just leave a note saying uh, the plagiarism showing that is being uh, thrown up is purely uh, based on the proper nouns used so the 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 your editor or you know the client knows that okay it's not really plagiarism it's just names of places that cannot be changed does that answer your question anika yeah ma'am yeah. yeah thank you okay no problem okay shobhitro how do you harmonize seo terminology this is something i'm going to tackle in the next workshop so i just request you to uh, hold on to that question uh okay ankit singh also has a similar question on plagiarism in technical articles um i think it's good to have a talk with uh, uh you know or, or have this understanding with the client or with the representative of your agency that technical terms are terms that you cannot change i think it's acceptable to uh for this overlap to happen when it comes to technical terms that i've already mentioned uh but those should only be limited to the terms whatever you write around it ought to be different or to be presented in a way that is not similar to any other article that's already published so proper nouns technical terms names of diseases names of certain laws acts all of these are permissible because you cannot and you must not change them i hope that is uh, clear uh okay keyword density makes repetition inevitable also restricts the creative flow of the article by forcing writer to include certain phrases or keywords a certain number of times again uh, anoras keywords is something that we want to discuss in the next workshop but just to uh uh you know answer at a very basic level yes a stuffing keywords makes the article read really bad and you must at all costs avoid it uh, it's good to you know uh, get an understanding of how many instances the client wants the keywords to appear and uh, usually it's it's you know it should not be obviously it depends on the word count and if the keyword is not grammatically correct like for instance if it's uh, open account now or something like that you have you should have the liberty to change it in a way that it fits uh in a grammatically proper fashion in the article so how to do that we will see in the next workshop which will which has a point about using keywords uh, seamlessly are there any other questions i'm not sure i've missed any but if there are please feel free to ask them okay i hope uh, uh, you found something of value in this workshop and uh, okay what role does word count play in terms of seo content writing okay uh 
I think uh, it's obviously got to do with uh, your the, the keywords that you include in the article, and uh, I mean there has to be a certain uniformity that has to be maintained because it's a it's a blog article, and you know uh, what it also depends on what kind of subheads and pointers the article is covering, and a lot depends on what how the client decides the work on. Suppose a topic does not have uh, say enough enough uh, meat or it does not have a lot of points to cover, you may not have to write longish articles because nobody wants to read that. So depending on what topic you're covering and uh, the kind of interest the client thinks it will have among readers is how they decide the word count. Okay, people want uh, the recording of this workshop, so I think uh, Manali and Amreen could uh, take that. Thank you guys for appreciating uh, the workshop. I really hope it helped and uh, I look forward to uh, hosting the next one and yeah, look forward to having all of you back again with some more interaction. Uh, it was really good of you all to participate uh, and that actually made the workshop more fun. So thank you for that. Over to you Amreen. Uh, thank you for the enriching experience, Sapna. Uh, I hope you all have learned a new thing today uh, through this workshop and we will be sending out the feedback forms as well as the recording uh, to everyone and we look forward to hearing your opinions through the feedback forms. Uh, we hope to see you join us again in the next workshop and thank you so much for joining this one. Thank you so much, everyone. Guys, bye-bye. See you all. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. 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 Norris, we'll come back to you with the dates and details of the next workshop soon. Thank you.